It is my privilege and honor to welcome not only a true advising professional, but also a friend and a mentor to many of us in this room, Dr. Charlie Nutt, Executive Director of NACADA, the Global Community for Academic Advising. Charlie. So sweet. Okay, those of you who know me know I cannot stand behind a podium. So you're just gonna have to deal with it. Um, I didn't need to say to Dean Mercer that I thought earlier that, you know, you only ask to speak before your family, and this is my family, either when you're retiring or dying. And so I just want to quote Mark Twain, his reports of my death and retirement have been greatly exaggerated, Dean, within that. I also want to thank, as we look at what we're talking about tonight with college completion through our personal connections, so much of what we're doing across the world is really built upon what's being done at many different levels. And one of those levels is a lot of the work that's been being done at the Gates Foundation. And I'd like to be able to, to uh, thank and recognize the Vice President of Gates, uh, Greg Ratliff for being a part of us tonight and being here. So we want to thank him so much for being a part of us. As someone said a minute ago, all you have to do is look at the headlines. Yesterday's Chronicle, these were some of the headlines. What lurks behind graduation rates? A lot of noise and little meaning. Adult audits found faults in completion competency-based programs eligibility for student aid. Teaching as a self-portrait of yourself and your students. And on the internet, nobody knows you're the wrong professor. So as you look at what we see every single day, we see clearly the academic advising is important to what we're doing, but it seems even more so because of the emphasis we now know is on completion and graduation. My favorite author, when this will work, was my Angelo, who died a few months ago. And she says, people forget what you say, they'll even forget what you do, but they never forget how you make them feel. That's what academic advising is all about. It's about making students feel that they can be successful. It's about helping students to understand that when they chose to come to your institution, that they made the best choice possible. 10 years from now, they're not gonna remember that you told them to take English on Tuesdays and Thursdays. <laughs> they're not even gonna remember that you got them out of a bind, more than likely. But I guarantee you, they're gonna remember how you made them feel. Did you make them feel they mattered? Did you make them feel they were not just a number at your institution or a graduation number or a completion number or a retention number, but they were a heart and soul and blood and what they did every day mattered? Is that what we do? And I think Maya Angelou clearly says it's how we make people feel. And I feel so strongly that that's what advisors do the best, is connecting with students and helping them understand where they need to go forth and move. We know that students and their success in achieving academic goals. Our students come to us with academic goals and sometimes they're not realistic. Sometimes they're not even their academic goals. They're other people's academic goals. They're not theirs. They come to us with career goals. You know, they come thinking that they're gonna make some major because somebody told them to do that and they have no idea what it is and what they need to do. They come with life goals. You know, where do you wanna be? What do you wanna do? But what they come with the most that I think is the most important is they come to us with dreams and passions. They come to us wanting to become people that they aren't now. They come to us wanting to not only better themselves, but better their families, better their communities, better their cities, better their countries, better the globe. 
and when wait they come, that's why we do what we do. And that's why academic advising is important. It's not about scheduling. It's not about registering. It's about changing students' lives. And what we do every day is we do that. So why is the student persistence to complete so, so important today? Well, let's, we've got to be realistic. You know, number one is college retention, persistence, graduation rates, influence public perceptions of higher education. You know, in the 70s, back when I was teaching in high school, Johnny Can't Read came out. And quite frankly, higher education has been allowed to float for a lot of years now without anybody talking about Johnny Can't Read and graduated from college. And now we're talking about that. It's the idea that now that perception of our community is what matters. A few years ago, ACE did a wonderful campaign in which they said we the goal was to get all of the United States in, to understand the concept of we teach the people who change the world. And I think that's a very valuable statement, but it also means that we have to realize that the perceptions of what we do really matter in how we work with our students. We know that state legislators, governing boards, underfunding sources are seriously looking at graduation rates. Raise your hand if your state right now already has in place some form of funding based on graduation completion. Look at the hands. Okay, how many of your states have something called College Complete Georgia or Kansas or America or wherever? Look at the numbers. So that we know that this is no longer something that we're just looking at. Our legislators are now looking at it. Our publics are looking at it. They want to be sure that the money that's coming to higher ed is being used in a way that's productive and suits students being, being successful. So that's important. We also know that parents and students' choices about where they go today includes collaboration and completion rates. You know, it used to just be they looked at how many faculty you might have that have PhDs. You know, how many, how many library books were in your library? You know, take me down Fraternity Row first before I see anything else. You know, those types of issues. We now have parents and children coming in to admissions and to recruitment meetings saying, what is your graduation rate? And they don't want to hear a graduation rate in six, eight, 10 years. They want to see a graduation rate today. They want to know that if they choose to send their student to you, that that student's going to graduate. And that graduation means that we are committed to institutional focus on learning and growth. Higher education is not all about us. And that's sometimes hard for us to understand. It's all about the students. And what we are here for is to help the students and teach the students what they need in order to be successful. But the bottom line is, the students are what important. You do do that, right? How many of you have ever said in your life, if the students would just leave, we'd had a better place to work? <laughs> Raise your hand. Rest of you are lying. You know you have. All right? But the problem being, they don't leave. All right? So we got to work with what we have and work with that. But what this shows us, though, is that in higher education today, globally across the world, higher education is being led, and I call sometimes kicking and screaming led, um, into a realization that we must see significant shifts and changes of culture. Changes of culture. Moving to a culture where student success and completion must drive our decision making. It's all about culture change. It's all about taking your campus and shifting it from being just about teaching and scheduling and being about the success of your students every single day as you work with them. Because the key here is we can't make change unless we change culture. And culture is not easy to change. You know, I say all the time, it's much easier to move a cemetery than a college. Dead people will get up and walk faster. 
that an academic senate will approve of change in program. Okay? So we've got to begin to think about how do we bring these together and how do we make those work and how do we look at that change in culture. And change isn't easy. We know that. You know, when asked, would you rather work for change or just complain, 81 of the respondents said, this is hard, do I have to pick? All right? Nobody really wants to change. What we want to do is we want to make change and figure out how to do it in a way that doesn't bother us. You know, it's, it's, as we look at it, there are three types of people. Are you the type of person who makes change happen? Are you connected on your campus to academic programs? Are you connected on your campus with advising and, and with how they fit together? It was very, very exciting. Janet Schulenberg is somewhere out there in the audience. And Janet told me yesterday that she's on a committee at Penn State University as an advisor that's looking at their curricular reform. Folks, that doesn't happen often. That's exciting to see that and to see those things occur. Some of us are the people who watch things happen. You know, we sit back, we wait. You know, we can outlive this D. We outlived the last one. You know, damn, he hung around, but we still got to outlast him. We've all had that. You know, the pendulum swing, he said, if we live long enough, it'll swing back the other way with us. So we have to really think about that idea that someone just sit back and just and, and say, when it really affects me, I'll think about it. And what we realize is it, if you wait until then, the bus has left, the wagon's left, and you're not even anywhere on it. And we've got to make sure. And then some of us fall in the category of who just wonder what the hell happened. <laughs> you, know, you drove up today and you said, by God, where'd that new building come from? <laughs> it wasn't there yesterday. Okay? Some of us just sit back and don't even know what occurred within that. One of the things we've got to begin thinking about is how do we communicate from the top levels which are hearing those conversations with College Complete America, which are hearing those conversations with the Gates Foundation, hearing those conversations with, with all sorts of groups. How do we look at those presidents and provosts and deeds, and how do we get that language and that information filtered down to advisors? Because many times advisors don't understand why we're doing all these news initiatives. Many of us, think that's just one more thing we've got to do. Because we don't see how it affects our students. We don't see how it affects the institution. So it's important that we not become the person who wonders what happens. It's important that we become part of that change and part of how we make that change occur. But too often, we take change for a double sword, you know? I see the value of change when it happens to you. Because you need it to change. Okay. You know you did, right? We say it about faculty, faculty say it about student affairs, we all say it about administrators. All right. But it's the idea that, you know, it, it's, it's good when somebody else has to change but don't bother us, or changes we seek in others, we associate as positive and with growth. You know, if, 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 if Susan Campbell changes and does what we want her to do, that's really good. Susan's growing as a professional and as a human being within that, and I'm so proud of her. But then we get to, when they challenge us to change, we think it's negative because it, we experience a sense of loss and a sense of comfort and a sense of control. Because any time you change, things don't always occur the way they used to occur. And any time you change, you're really looking at what may be something that you're very comfortable doing is no longer in the best interest of students. Many of us are doing things on our campus, and you can finish the line for me, because we have always done it that way. Without looking at 
what do those changes really mean and how do they affect our students? And that while that change may be painful or difficult or we may feel a sense of loss, is it going to enhance our student learning? And that's what we have to look at as we think about change. And we don't make change just for change's sake. You know, a lot of campuses, any new thing that comes down the road, we change to it. You know, we just want to be on that wagon. You know, we're afraid if we get lost, we won't be doing that. We got to always jump on any wagon to get there. You know, and then when that wagon doesn't work, we jump off and say, oh, we weren't really on that wagon. It was a joke. Okay, or as Terry Musser says, when they're running, running you out of town with fire and crackers, you get in front of the, the group and make it think it's a parade. Okay, I love that quote by Terry. Because sometimes we have to realize that change and loss are important and we have to realize how we work with that. We know since 1993, Vincent Tinto has been telling us that retention is a byproduct of good educational experiences. Please note, he doesn't say it's, he doesn't say it's a, a um, goal. He doesn't say that it's a number. What he says is it's a, the, the byproduct of quality undergraduate experiences. What happens to students from the moment they're accepted until they walk across that stage? What is that experience that they're having? And if we are working on changing the experiences our students have, they are going to be retained at a higher rate. If we work on the quality of the education within the classroom and outside the classroom, they're going to persist to graduation. If we look at what advising can bring into the classroom outside of the classroom, then they're going to persist to graduation. But if all we do is set numbers, and many of you have been at schools that have made this, this Mistake. You know, we're going to improve it by 12%. If you will give me $100,000 to open a new advising center, I guarantee you we will improve advising by 12% by next year. Casey, you'll be looking for a job when you do that at Arizona State. I just want to tell you. Because we know there's too many things that affect that, which means advising is a piece of all of these puzzles, and we have to figure out how we put them together and where we put them as we go through that. So. Don't ever forget that quote. Don't ever forget that way back in 1993, Vincent Tito said to us, it's a byproduct. It's not something that we should set a goal toward. We should always be looking at what is the best educational experience that our students are having inside and outside the classroom. And if we are all focused on that, then obviously students are going to be retained they're going to graduate because they feel connected to the university. They feel connected to the college. They feel connected to the institution because of those experiences that we have. Mark Lowenstein, our, our, our pay, uh, winner for Virginia Gordon this year, has said for several years that excellent advisor does the same for the students in town curriculum that an excellent teacher does for one course. Think back to your best teacher. Think back to the teachers you had. Dr. Faith Willis taught Sociology 105. Coastal Georgia back then was Brunswick College. And I remember her to this day. I remember what she assigned to us. And I remember how it impacted me. You know, I grew up in a little bitty town in southeast Georgia, a skinny white boy named Nut with glasses. I had a lot going for me. Okay, all right. What Faith Willis did in sociology is she, is she said from day one, we're going to use this semester to get you to expand your comfort zone, to talk to people who are not like you, who you have to, to figure out what their, their passions are and how to do that. So what she did was she divided us into groups of five, and those groups all had to go and spend four weeks interviewing families who were in the third or fourth generation of living in public housing in my town of Brunswick. Folks, that was a huge culture shift for me. 
I had never been to those communities. I had never been inside those homes. And to hear those people talk so passionately about how much they wanted their children to be who would get them out of that has affected me my entire life. I mean, what that course did for me was made me a different person. I truly remember leaving that course and truly remember going that day and going over and changing my major to education because I knew I wanted to be a part of this change and a part of where we wanted to go. So I think Mark has hit it so squarely on the head, but the problem we have to look at is we got to realize that sometimes we assume learning is automatic, that it's the natural product of good teaching or good advising. And therefore, we may focus only on developing good teaching and advising skills on how to do things. And that's not a bad thing. It's a good thing that we can look at. We know Tito in 2004, this study talked about that the three things institutions have in common that are, e that are interested in retention are one, teaching students to make decisions effectively. Our students do not come to college knowing how to, to make decisions effectively. They've had all the decisions made for them all their lives. You know, many of you have children who are under the age of 12 and you've spent the past 12 years toting them to ballet and volleyball and soccer and t-ball and dance and, you know, to make sure they stayed out of trouble and went and did something. You know, I'm from the generation, my mama put me outside at 8 in the morning and said, come back at lunch. <laughs> she then took us outside after lunch and said, take a nap under the tree. And then come home when it gets dark. You can't do that with your, your kids anymore. But what it means is they come to college not knowing how to make decisions of their own because they've never had that opportunity. So what things we've got to do is teach students how to effectively make decisions. What are those priorities that drive that? What are those skills that drive that? That doesn't just, people just don't come out of the womb knowing how to do that. And they don't appear on our campus knowing how to do that. We have to teach them that. We have to teach students how to effectively and make decisions on careers and majors. And the number one thing is there's a difference between a career and a major. Turn the lights up for me. Turn the lights up for me. The light man went to sleep. Okay. All right. Raise your hand if you were doing today exactly what your undergraduate degree was in. Raise your hand. The few hands that are up are faculty members. Because the rest of us are doing something totally different than what our major was. Who better to talk to students about that there's a difference between a career and a major? Who better to talk to students about the value of a liberal arts degree or the value of gen ed if they look at their programs and look through that? You know, I, I, I work at Kansas State, as, as you know by now, and my first semester there, I was teaching the graduate program in the student college personnel, and the, the, um, one of my folks came in and the student said, you know, I don't know if this is really what I want to do. And I said, okay, why are you in this program then? And he said, well, my college advisor told me it would probably be a good program, and Kansas State has a good program, so, so I, I, I just uh, came here. And I said, well, where are you from? And he said, some little Kansas town in northwest Kansas, someplace I haven't been to yet, um, up there. And, and I said, so if you don't want to do this, what do you want to do? And he said, well, you know, what I really want to do is I want to go back and I want to run the farm for my parents. You know, this farm's been in my family's generation for years and years and generations. And I want to go back and do that. So we talked about did a degree in, in agriculture and ag economics and what he needed to do. And I, and I sent him away to go do research. Sorry, Dean, we didn't keep him in the college. And where you wanted to go with that? And he came back in about three weeks and he said, I've decided what I want to do. Dead serious. I said, what? He said, I'm going to major, I'm going to get a master's in philosophy. <laughs> you did the same thing I did. <laughs> and I said, what in the world are you going to do with a master's degree in philosophy? 
And he said, you know, I'm going to spend the rest of my life driving a tractor or a combine, and I want to know something to think about while I'm doing that. <laughs> Is that not a kid that looked at Jen Ed and something other than what you just got to do because it's in the catalog? That truly understand those points and how you work toward that. We have to teach students how to maneuver higher education and identify your life supports. We do a very good job with identifying supports. We got signs and we got flyers and we got websites and we got all those things, you got, we got these centers and everybody knows about them. But you know there's a big difference when you're going to the writing center after you fail the fifth essay and going to the writing center before you write the first essay. So our students have, can identify all those resources all day, but they don't utilize them until it's too late. So what they went through is teach them how to utilize them on a very early basis and also maneuver higher education. Uh, it's a secret, in case y'all don't know it, but higher education is confusing. <laughs> and we make it a treasure hunt that if students can find all the right clues and they don't get voted off the island, by God, they got a degree. <laughs> Getting a college degree should not be a treasure hunt, guys. It should be a map. It should be a map that they follow, just like your GPS in your car, just like your map for MapQuest. You know, your GPS in your car is so sweet when you get lost. So sweet. It says recalculating. <laughs> Side note, the lady who says recalculating lives in Kansas City, and I went to see a play one night, all night, I kept thinking, where have I heard that voice? <laughs> And I got back in my car, and it was the garbage lady. I thought, oh, I know her. Okay. But, you know, she says recalculating. Are we teaching our students to recalculate? Are we teaching our students when they're not successful here to recalculate where they need to be, or when they're not successful the first time, do they go somewhere else? Which sometimes is not in higher education at all. When if someone there had said, Let's talk about how we can recalculate, how we can move you where you are. So we really want to think about that. How many of you on your campus have ever said, oh, I'll call so-and-so, and you picked up the phone and thought, oh, God, who does that now? That office moved. You ever had that happen? Can you imagine how our students feel? Okay, when we send them somewhere, they have no idea why we sent them there. And then the very rare ones that walk into your office, you've all had them, they walk in and just look at you. <laughs> yeah. and, and you finally get everything. They say, well, who sent you here? That lady. <laughs> you know, that lady over there in that building. Okay? Because they have no idea why they were sent to you. Because they don't know how to maneuver higher education. Our job is to teach students how to maneuver education. That is our curriculum. That is what academic advising teaches. We are not service providers. We are not people who provide a help and assistance. We are people who teach and our students learn every day from us because we teach and because we work through that. So we got to think about what does being a learner center look like then, if we think of it from the other standpoint. Well, the first is, what are the students learning? Have you defined on your campus what students are learning through academic advising? Have you sat down and had that conversation, whether you are a 2,000 student liberal arts, small religious college, or whether you're a $26,000 Kansas State, have you sat down and had that conversation about what do we want students to learn because of academic advising? Because if we haven't had that conversation, then how can we define what it is we're teaching and figure out how to teach it? You know, so we gotta figure out what it is we want them to learn. How is a student learning that? You know, is a student learning that if they come to us enough, we'll do it for them? For many students, that's what they learn. 
Okay? Other students learn the great skill of advisor shopping. Right? I'll talk to you and you tell me one thing. I'll go to you and you tell me something. Finally, Ruth tells me what I want to hear. And she's the best advisor in the world. I put on that evaluation. She good. Okay? But it's because I finally found somebody who would tell me what I wanted to hear within that. So I have to realize that how the student learning is learning is very important. What, what educational experiences are you building in your academic advising programs? What strategies, what experiences are you building that students will have as they work with you as an advisor and as their work? You gotta know where the students apply the learning. Now, many of our students can tell us everything they need to know, everything they have to take to graduate, and they never ever graduate. You've had those kids, right? They could fill out the curriculum form, they could check off the boxes, they could check, but they never quite figured out how to get, pull all that together and graduate. I go to campuses all the time uh, to talk to, to um, campuses that I always make a point sometime during the day to just walk across campus and just talk to students randomly. Well, with this George accent, that was kind of interesting to Cutter, I'll tell you that much. Um, but what I always ask is one question. I say, tell me the conversation you've had about what you need to do to graduate from XYZ college or university, and who did you have that conversation with? And I have yet to have a student tell me they've had that conversation. And how many of you believe you do it every day? They're not hearing it. What they're hearing is what courses to take. What they're hearing is what schedule, what order, how you meet the bureaucracy of the institution, but they're not hearing what they have to do to graduate. Folks, this is not our degree. This is the student's degree. So what are we teaching them in order to be successful that they can apply to do that and work with that. And then last, how the current learning position the students for the future. What is it they learn today that they're going to need next week or next year or three years from now within that? You know, I always use the example of internships. How many of you are internships supported on your campus? Raise your hand. Look at the hands, great. Okay, how many of you, what do you do, at, what, what happens when you deal with a freshman? What's a freshman need to know about internships? They need to know they exist. That's all they need to know, that they exist and they're a good thing. Sophomores, they need to figure out how to start choosing internships and what they may look like and what they may learn from them. Juniors, they need to actually apply for the transcripts I mean, for the internship, figure out how to do the letter, put it in there, get it done. Seniors, they go do the internship, and they come back, and they self-reflect on it, and then are able to put it into a, a letter of application that looks, makes them look different than the other 9,000 applications that company has. But what do we do? We tell them everything they ever needed to know about internships the first day we saw them because we're afraid we'll never ever see them again. We gotta change that curriculum. We gotta say, what do first year students need to know? And what do second year students need to know? And what do third year students need to know? What fourth year? Palo Alto College in the Alamo City District has been working for several years, and one of the things they've done because they're a community college is they've looked at what are the competencies or the learning outcomes they want students to have achieved between zero and 30 hours, between 30 and 60 hours, between 60 and 90 hours, because they know they don't have one, two, three, four years. And they're setting up assessment strategies, they're setting up those pieces, they're really bringing those together, but it's the idea that we've got to build that curriculum and work with that. Nancy King says, and I love the quote, we're interpreters who help students navigate their world as such we have to make connections. Higher education is a foreign language. There's a foreign, we know it, they don't. Okay, they come here, we talk about grade point average. Bursar's office, 
registration. And they have no idea what that means. And we're using the terms as if they know that. So we've got to realize that we've got to help students make those connections and be able to navigate because it's a foreign language, especially first-generation students. How many of you are first-generation students? Raise your hand. You remember what it felt like when you first went to college? Okay, that you had no idea what was going on? Everybody else knew but you? All right, and that's how first-generation students feel. We at Kansas State are doing a whole lot of work with first generation through the Souter Family Foundation and is working very closely with the College of Education there. But it's the idea that first generation students need a whole lot of help and teaching to know where to be. So what's our responsibility? One, we got to become aware and involved in the conversations throughout the global higher education community and our institutions about the impact of completing gateway courses. All the literature is telling us that students who complete gateway courses at an earlier level tend to graduate and at a high level. CCA has, College of Clean America has been saying that, Gates Foundation has been saying that, the, the John Gardner's Foundation has been saying that, but we've got to go back and look at those gateway courses. You know, years ago I read a, a, by a president who was a science major and she said in this article that the thing that worried her the most was at her institution that they did everything they could to beat the joy of science out of their students in the first year. <laughs> because they put them in lecture halls of 500 for biology. And students who came in so excited about science, by the end of that first semester, they were just beat down within that. So how are we making those changes? The intentional proactive initiatives of working with transfer students. Our students are transferring here and there and back and forth and in between and we gotta know what to do with them. And it can't be by accident. Many times transfer students learn what they need to do by accident, not by the intentionality of what some program we set forth. So we have gotta look at that. We have gotta look at what it is that that we need to know about students and what technology do we need to track our students' initiatives. Many of us are still not understanding how to use technology. And we're looking at where students are, what we can do with that, how we can pull this together. We've got to begin really thinking about that. And that means that you don't have a technology program because you have banner. <laughs> or because you have people solved. Okay? That does not make a technology program. What that makes is a registration program. And we're talking about technology for improving education. So we've got to look at those. We got to investigate, study, and look at the literature in academic advising and, in, and retention constantly. You know, I teach graduate students and I tell them constantly, tell me what was in the Chronicle today. Tell me what was in the Inside Education Day. Tell me what was in because many of us are sitting here in this room tonight and we've never even picked up a chronicle of higher education. Or we've never picked up a journal for Nakata and read all the way through it. And I can relate to that. When I first started getting Nakata journals back in 1992, I put them on the shelf because they were purdy. <laughs> they all had different colors, okay? And the cause, the reason for that was I had a master's degree that I chose on purpose that didn't have a thesis. So when I opened up the, the journal and it had some things like ANOVA <laughs> and multiple regression, I like sweat down my back, okay? Well, then I finally kind of opened it and started looking at the implication part at the end. What this implication? And I thought, well, if that's the implication, maybe what does the research show? But folks, that's not something I knew how to do. And that's got to be part of our professional development for all academic advisors, is how do you look at the research and determine how that research effectively can be utilized at your institution with your students? Not because down the road at, at UT Austin or down the road at K-State or down the road at, at Rowan University, just because they're doing that doesn't mean it fits your campus. And many of us are trying to take programs from other campuses and just put them on our campus and think they'll work. 
and we can no longer do that. We got to think about who are your, your at-risk students? What are the issues? Who are the students you need to focus on? What are those risk factors that they have? And this is more than knowing an SAT score, and it's more than knowing a GPA off a high school transcript. What are the risk factors? Being first generation is a risk factor. Working part time so, and, and, and going to school is a full time is a risk factor. Being a student athlete and not being recognized that that student athlete has two full time jobs is a risk factor. And how are we looking at those risk factors and not just looking at test scores? And then the bottom one, the last two, what's the commitment of students? Students have got to be committed to a college degree. But we have to help them learn how to be committed to that. And then last is, what are we doing that maybe does or doesn't work? That's a hard one. Because then we got to sit back and look at our campuses that we think are perfect and come up with all the things that maybe aren't working. And so we really got to be willing to do that. So there's several things I want to end with. First, student success is everybody's business. It's not just one group. We all have to be involved in every area. Continuing, we've got to co cultivate um, an atmosphere of continual, ethnic, um, excuse me, continual uh, measurement and assessment. Because if it's measured, then it has value. If it's not measured, it doesn't have value. So we've got to begin to assess academic advising in ways other than the ratio advisor to student and student satisfaction surveys. What are students learning and how are we assessing those? We've got to recruit faculty, staff, administrators who are committed to student learning, retention, persistence, success, and academic advising. And, and you may sit there and say to me, you know, why would we not do that? We do it all the time. We do it all the time. I was hired to teach at Coastal Georgia back in 1987 and teach English. And the day before the new students showed up, my, my dean walked in and said, oh, by the way, in that bottom drawer down there, those are Paul's files. Paul was the guy I replaced. Those are his advisees. They'll be here in the morning. You might want to look at it. That was my total training. I had, until that point, I did not even know I was supposed to act as an academic advisor. Sometimes you have faculty who come to your campus who've seen the job posting in Chronicle. They've seen it on monster.com. They've sent in a resume. They've come to your campus for a visit. And no one ever says to them, oh, by the way, we value academic advising. What's your philosophy? What's your experience? And then they get there and we wonder why they get mad when they have to advise. Okay? It's not that, student, that faculty don't want to advise, it's because many times they don't know they're supposed to. And we've given them no professional development in which to do it well. And we really have to work on that. I love this quote by, by John Garner, who was the, the uh, former Secretary of Health, Education, and Welfare, we all face with a series of great opportunities brutally disguised as unsolvable problems. <laughs> I love that. Okay? I'm a firm believer if you've got a problem, you can bring it to me all day long, but bring me a solution. And then we'll talk about it. But you know, my office is not the place to come dump all your problems. Right, Jennifer? <laughs> okay? I, that's, not, you know, that's, not, that's not my job. Right? My job is to help you figure out how to solve it, but you got to bring a solution to me, and we'll work on it together within that. But a lot of people like to just dump the problems without looking at the solutions, and we have to begin to really think about that. Coming together is a beginning. Staying together is progress. Working together is success. We all came together here in Minnesota. All 3,080 of us. And by Saturday, most of you will be going home. So you came here, but if that's all you did, and then you go home, you could have stayed home to begin with. What are you going to do when you leave? How are you going to stay connected with each other? How are you going to stay connected to what's going on in the field? How are you going to be able to... to 
to go back to your campus and say, let's look at this body of research I heard so-and-so present on that we've never looked at before. So we've got to stay together. And then last, we've got to work together. And folks, that's probably what Nakata does best of anything is we work together. And we put our minds together and come up with solutions for our students. But we've got to do that on our campuses as well. Love this. You can't teach people anything. You have to help them discover it within themselves. Galileo. Sometimes we spend a whole lot of time trying to force students to learn something when really what we do is have to teach them how to find it themselves. That they have to search that out. But we have to teach them how to search that out. And then with the right approach comes the right result every time as we look forward, as we look at those pieces. So how do we do this? And how do we work with this? Well, one thing we got to do is recognize that everybody in this room is a leader. Every one of you in this room is a leader. Every one of you. And that your first job is to, to, to define reality for when you go home. And your second job is to say thank you to the people who really do a good job and want to work toward the future. You know, we do the reality check pretty good. We don't do the thank you check very well. Right? And people aren't being thanked by money because you aren't giving them any. Right? Advisors are not here because we make big bucks. Right? We do it because we have a passion. We do it because something inside us is different than other people. I'm not saying that that makes us odd, but it might. But what I'm saying is it's that passion, it's that dream, it's that drive that really makes us where we want to be and what we want to do. So I want to leave you with a thought and with a concept of what we might want to think about as we go through that. So Rodney's going to help me by showing some slides. And I want to introduce J.B. Taylor, who's going to help me at the piano. And J.B., if you want to start. Perhaps we had a wicked childhood. Perhaps we had a miserable youth. But somewhere in our wicked, miserable past, there must have been a moment of truth. Because here we are, there you are, teaching your students whether or not they really care. So somewhere in our youth and childhood, there must have been something Nothing comes from nothing. Nothing ever could. So somewhere in our youth and childhood, you all must have done something good. Thank you so much for being here. And thank you for being a part of this conference. Thank you.